Halton C. Arp received his bachelor's degree from Harvard College in 1949 and his PhD from California Institute of Technology in 1953, both cum laude, that's Latin for with the highest honors. He is a professional astronomer who early in his career conducted Edwin Hubble's Nova Search in M31. He has earned the Helen B. Warner Prize, the Newcomb Cleveland Award, and the Alexander von Humboldt Senior Scientist Award. For 28 years, he was a staff astronomer at the Mount Palomar and Mount Wilson observatories. While there, he produced his well-known catalog of peculiar galaxies that are disturbed or irregular in appearance. Arp discovered from photographs and spectra with big telescopes that many pairs of quasars, quasi-stellar objects, which have extremely high redshift Z values and are therefore thought to be receding from us very rapidly and thus must be located at a great distance from us, are physically connected to galaxies that have low red shift and are known to be relatively close by. Because of ARP's observations, the big assumption that high red shift objects have to be very far away, on which the Big Bang Theory and all of accepted cosmology is based, has to be fundamentally re-examined. From The second property was that quasars are very small, compact objects, sometimes only a light year across. So if quasars are really at their extreme redshift with most other objects, and that there is no direct indication that they are actually at their proposed redshift distances. In fact, it is argued that if Hubble had first been given the plots for quasars, he and other astronomers would never have concluded that the universe was expanding. The second property was that quasars are very small, compact objects, sometimes only a light year across. So if quasars are really at their extreme redshift distances, they must then be the brightest and most energetic objects known to astronomers. So energetic, in fact, that untestable, almost metaphysical mechanisms must be applied to explain the phenomena. On the other hand, when placed at their observed distances, that is, in the neighborhood of nearby galaxies, their brightness and energies become normal, and no special mechanisms need to be evoked. This problem has led many astronomers to abandon the idea that all redshifts are due to their speed of recession away from the Earth. And if this is true, then there is no need for an expanding universe, and the Big Bang never happened. Questions arise. Is there a connection between certain types of galaxies and the quasar? Are quasars ejected from galaxies 
and in fact proto-galaxies themselves? Is there some other astrophysical process which can explain the redshift discrepancies? One of the world's most controversial experts on the structure and morphology of quasars, Halton C. Arp, has for 35 years proposed just such an idea. For the heresy of opposing orthodox interpretations of the redshift problem, Arp has had to pay a heavy price, the same price paid by many a scientist with new and innovative ideas. Dr. Arp was forced to resign from his permanent position at the Carnegie Institute of Washington Observatories after the Caltech head of the Telescope Allocation Committee threatened him by saying, unless he changed his line of research, they would take away his telescope time. Due to this fact and his ongoing struggle against the established paradigms, Arp is often referred to as the modern Galileo. I remember when I sent the paper into, uh, the first paper into Astrophysical Journal, uh, on, on the nature of companion galaxies, and I had a lot of them on the ends of spiral arms so that it was sure that they were connected, and I showed that they were systematically redshifted. I sent that in with, <laughs> with, with naive, great expectations that people would be terribly interested and impressed on this, and the editor of the Astrophysical Journal at that time was Subramanian Chandrasekhar, who had a fantastic reputation as a, as a uh, master theoretician and also quite an incomprehensible theoretician and a, and a tremendously powerful uh, figure in the, in the field and editor of the Astrophysical Journal, which was probably the most powerful position in the field. And uh, he chose not to, in his wisdom and judicial fairness, chose not to send it to a referee, but he just wrote across the paper this exceeds my imagination, and he sent it back to the director of my institute, Horace Babcock, with the obvious implication, you've got to do something about this, this uh, staff member of yours who's, who's doing these very bad things. And so Horace called me down in the office one day after this, and I walked in the, his office, into the director's office, and I saw this paper lying on, in front of him with Chandra Sekar's scrawl across it, and Horace looked at me and, and said, well, he said, this is just too, too much, and, and, and you're going to have to uh, uh, start looking for another job. And so all I could say to him was, well, if you send me that in writing, please send me in, in writing. And I was obviously incorrect and embarrassing research that ARP does. So finally they sent, uh, please send me in, in writing. And I was waited in great trepidation for it for weeks and months to get something in writing and I finally never did so I realized that he decided to give me another chance so to speak. Uh, so that was fairly early in the game and then some years went by and there was the, the, the competition for time particularly on the 200 inch telescope was getting more and more heated and, and people were saying well we can't continue to give time to this obviously incorrect and embarrassing research that ARP does. So finally they sent uh, a letter to me from the allocation committee, including a number of the younger members of my, uh, my institute, saying that unless I changed my line of research, that they would have to take away my telescope time. At that point, I considered the situation very carefully, and I figured that the the evidence, although a lot more evidence could be gathered and has since been gathered since then, the important thing was not the evidence, uh, because if it was true, it would come out someday. The important thing was the principle of scientific investigation, whether people, whether scientists could follow uh, new lines of investigation and follow up on, a, on, on evidence which apparently contradicted the current uh, theorems and the current paradigms. And I also felt that regardless of what happened to me personally, that this was the important issue and that, that I had no choice but to resign on the point of this issue so that if it developed, which I thought it would, that the, my line of investigation was correct, that people then, when in the future, would say, okay, this was the wrong thing to do, 
And in the future, we're going to have to see that this kind of thing doesn't happen again. Peculiar Galaxy NGC 7603, discovered 30 years ago by Halton Arp, is one of the more striking examples of galaxy quasar connections. It has recently been re-examined after the discovery of two new quasar-type objects embedded in the connecting filament. The renowned optical astronomer Margaret Burbage has for decades been a central figure in the struggle to bring controversial observations such as NGC 7603 to the attention of conventional astronomers. And for her fairness and untiring efforts in the field, she has become one of the most widely respected women in astronomy. There's a very interesting galaxy uh, known as NGC 7603 it has a, it's a Seifert galaxy, that means it has a, one of these active nuclei with strong emission lines and a lot of activity, obviously, going on in its center. And it was studied years ago by uh, Chip Arp in his um, Atlas of Peculiar Galaxies. It has a spiral arm that seems to come right outside of the galaxy trailing right out and it ends up on a, a, a fainter galaxy but it ends right up uh, as though it's uh, as though it's connected connected the nuclei of, of the two galaxies in this atlas of peculiar galaxies which uh, published in 1966 uh, that was the point of the atlas and one of the objects just to, to illustrate uh, what a peculiar galaxy is is this uh, what is now famous NGC 7603 and this is the central Seifert which means just a very very active galaxy with a lot of energy in the nucleus and uh, a lot of explosive energy and so forth and uh, here is the high redshift companion here and you see it's joined by a, a filament, a material. Uh, it turns out from the observations that this filament and material is material of the galaxy, gas and dust and stars and so forth that's been drawn out in the ejection. But the astonishing thing, the controversial matter, is that this galaxy is a much higher redshift than this. Now, NGC 7603 has uh, uh, one redshift of um, about uh, 8,000 kilometers a second, and uh, the other galaxy has a much larger redshift. So how can they be connected? Well, because they've, they've got to understand this, and uh, I've heard uh, good friend astronomers say, well, there's, there's more out there in the universe than we understand. What's really happening in these systems is that the centers of the galaxies are the places where creation is taking place rather than just in a big bang. And so you're looking at all these mini bangs where matter and energy are actually literally being created. And this is an old idea, which is not ours. Originally, it was due to the very famous um, Armenian astronomer, Viktor Ambatsumian, who only died a few years ago, who also argued that galaxies, which appear to be coming apart and objects that are coming out of them are coming out of them. Very simple idea. But Ambatsumian, who was a very well-known theorist, always said, you must look at the observations and maybe if things are coming apart, appear to be coming apart, maybe they are coming apart. Conventional astronomers don't allow things to come apart. They always say there's enough dark matter in the, in the system to hold it together. I've come to the conclusion that what it is that will unseat an established uh, prejudice, a strongly established prejudice, is one observation. One single observation, a usually a very simple one. It was very, very strong just from looking at this picture, that these objects had been ejected from the central galaxy and that they were initially at high redshift and the redshift decayed as time went on. And therefore we were looking at a physics that was operating in the universe in which matter was born with low mass and with very uh, high redshift. And as it matured and evolved into our present form, that we were seeing the birth and evolution of of galaxies in the universe.
If protoquasars ejected from the nucleus of active galaxies themselves evolve into new, younger galaxies, astrophysicists must find experimentally and observationally the mechanisms which describe this phenomena. One model explains that the protoquasars are ejected, trapped in the galaxy's extreme magnetic field, aligned along the spiral arms, thus explaining the torn, disturbed features often observed in the galactic medium, and the frequent appearance of high redshift companion galaxies attached by filaments to a lower redshift parent galaxy. The other and most frequently observed alignment is when quasars appear to have been directly ejected out of the galaxy's active nucleus along its line of least resistance, creating a field of systematically high to low redshift quasars or younger to older evolved protogalaxies. This is exemplified in innumerable systems like the one around the galaxy quasar field of NGC 3516. If one disregards the proposed redshift distance to these objects, observation clearly points to ejection as a likely explanation for their close vicinity to the central galaxies around which they are found. These results, though preliminary, are promising developments which may lead the way to new and exciting insights in cosmology. One of the best of solar system is passing through an interstellar cloud that physics says should not exist. The magnetic cloud. Using data from Voyager, we have discovered a strong magnetic field just outside our solar system, explains lead author Mirav Ofer. A NASA heliophysics. Impressive. The local fluff is what they're calling it. Astronomers call the cloud we're running into now Local interstellar cloud or local fluff for short. It's about 30 light years wide and contains a wispy mixture of hydrogen and helium atoms at a temperature of about 6,000 degrees Celsius. By the heliosphere and heliosheath, an area before the boundary to interstellar space, seem to be doing their jobs. There is a possibility that the fluff is compressing our bubble. As our solar system passes through the fluff, it becomes oblong, while simultaneously resisting the magnetic bubbles of the fluff. There is also the possibility that there are cloudlets of significantly higher density gas within the fluff. Remember what Stephen Smith said about them being drunk on hot gas. Could these higher density cloudlets make it through the heliosphere and into our solar system? Hmm, I'd be more concerned about zapping the sun's electric current or vice versa. I do know from reading Worlds in Collision that, that we are in a supernova remnant. I don't know if that's the fluff they're talking about. It goes on, the average density of local fluff is about 0.3 atoms per cubic centimeter. Put this into perspective, the density of the edge of the Earth's atmosphere is about 12 billion atoms per cubic centimeter. At this extremely thin density, there is much reason to worry about it penetrating our heliosphere. Hmm. But if cloudlets of significantly higher densities came through, they could potentially burst our bubble. According to astrophysicists, these cloudlets could allow more cosmic rays to penetrate our solar system, potentially wreaking havoc on our climate. Oh, I thought that was our fault. But we only have another 10,000 years before we pass through the fluff and our cosmic sky clears. Well, I think if something was going to happen, it would have happened. That's their artist rendering. What I like about this website is all the links are dead. I wanted to do a little check on this Russian scientist guy. While anthropomorphic causes of climate change are undeniable, there could potentially be additional outside factors at play. According to a Russian scientist named Dr. Alexev Dmitriev, this energy that is being emitted from the fluff could be affecting 
all the planets in our solar system. Dimitriev believes that this energy is producing hybrid processes and excited energy states in not just the planets, but also the sun. So, what are the consequences of this for life on Earth? Dimitriev states that this excited state could accelerate a magnetic pole shift. Yep, it could affect ozone distribution in the atmosphere, and it could generally increase the frequency of catastrophic climate events. I remember, uh, Cosmos without gravitation. Tolkovsky makes a point that I didn't even consider before. That the ozone does not mix with the oxygen. It's through our whole atmosphere, but it's a compound. How does that happen? How do the gases stay up in the atmosphere without getting mixed up? They have weight, electromagnetic force. Of course, it all has to do with that. Magnetized water and it rises up into the sky. Whether Dimitriev's prediction is prescient or over dramatic, we may soon have more data surrounding this phenomenon. I would say yes. NASA's Voyager probes have almost breached the heliosphere to enter interstellar space. It's, it's a long one where the fluff begins. The probes are currently in the heliosheath and able to measure the magnetic field of the fluff. As they get closer, they will hopefully be able to tell us more. I don't think this is going to be an issue at all. The universe would be chaos if this was able to happen. And they always say magnetic, but they never say electric. So it's more about the charge. Fluffy mystery solved. Our solar system is passing through a cloud of interstellar material that shouldn't be there, astronomers say. And now, the decades-old Voyager spacecraft have helped solve the mystery. The cloud is called the local fluff. It's about 30 light-years wide and holds a wispy mix of hydrogen and helium atoms. According to a NASA statement released today, stars that exploded nearby about 10 million years ago should have crushed the fluff or blown it away. So what's holding the fluff in place? Using data from Voyager, we have discovered a strong magnetic field just outside the solar system. Explained Marev Ofer, a NASA heliophysics guest investigator from George Mason University. This magnetic field holds the interstellar cloud together, the fluff, and solves the long-standing puzzle of how it can exist at all. The fluff is much more strongly magnetized than anyone had previously suspected. This magnetic field can provide the extra pressure required to resist destruction. Ofer and colleagues detail the discovery in the December 24th issue of the journal Nature. NASA's two Voyager probes have been racing out of the solar system for more than 30 years. They are now beyond the orbit of Pluto and on the verge of entering interstellar space. Well, they've been on the verge for well, at least 10 years. During the 1990s, Voyager 1 became the farthest man-made object in space. The Voyager craft, racing in opposite directions, have revealed, among other things, that the bubble around our solar system is squashed. The Voyagers are not actually inside the local fluff, Oprah said, but they are getting close and can sense what the cloud is like as they approach it. The fluff is held at bay just beyond the edge of the solar system by the sun's magnetic field, which is inflated by solar wind into a magnetic bubble more than 6.2 billion miles wide, 10 billion kilometers. Called the heliosphere, this bubble protect the inner solar system from galactic cosmic rays and interstellar clouds. The two voyagers are located in the outermost layer of the heliosphere, or heliosheet, where the solar wind is slowed by the pressure of interstellar gas. Voyager 1 entered the heliosheath in December 2004, and Voyager 2 followed in August 2007. These crossings provided key data for the new study. Other interstellar clouds might also be magnetized. Ofer and colleagues figure, and we could eventually run into some of them, their strong magnetic fields could compress the heliosphere even more than it is compressed now. According to NASA, additional compression could allow more cosmic rays to reach the inner solar system, possibly affecting terrestrial climate and the ability of astronauts to travel safely through space. Hmm. 
I'm wondering right now why it is they feel compelled to say they figured it out. I think I know why. Could it be that they just slightly kind of feel the electric universe breathing down their necks? Let's go take a look at the electric universe and see if we can find it. February 17th, 2015. Charged plasma surrounds the solar system. Electric sun theory presupposes that the sun is a glowing anode or a positively charged electrode. Its oppositely charged cathode is invisible. A virtual cathode called the heliosphere that exists billions of kilometers from its surface, where a double layer isolates the sun's plasma cell from the galactic plasma that surrounds it. Galactic plasma is otherwise called the interstellar medium, ISM. Electric forces work within a double charge layer above the sun's surface, generating active plasma phenomena that are seen by orbiting solar probes, as well as ground-based instruments. Celestial bodies interact through conductive plasma and are connected by circuits. So the sun is also assumed to be electrically connected with the galaxy. The sun can be thought of as an, an unstable electrically charged object, seeking equilibrium with its environment. Charges flowing into and out of the sun can sometimes increase to the point where it releases plasma discharges called solar flares. Conventional scientists think that solar flares and their associated coronal mass ejection CME, are caused by magnetic loops reconnecting with each other, causing a short circuit. Magnetic reconnection is a poorly constructed theory, but it is the only explanation offered by heliophysicists. A dark mode plasma emission is constantly radiating from the sun, traveling at a speed of 700 kilometers per second when it is at its most energetic. In a gravity-dominated universe, solar radiation pressure cannot explain how charged particles from the sun accelerate past Venus, Earth, and the rest of the planets. Prior to the solar wind's discovery, no one expected such acceleration. Electric universe proponents think that there is an obvious explanation. Electric fields in space. Coherent electric charges flow through the solar system, so it is reasonable to conclude that dark mode solar plasma is affected by electrodynamic fields. Since the circuit that connects the sun with the Milky Way extends for hundreds of thousands of light years. Electrical energy is probably constrained by magnetically confined Brooklyn currents, providing power to the solar anode. The electric sun creates flares, the hot corona, and all other solar phenomena because it responds to the charges and in electrical input from our galaxy. Berkeley current filaments electrify the solar system, supplying more or less power to the sun as they oscillate in power output. Arc mode, glow mode, and dark mode discharges are all influenced by those flowing electric charges. These ideas most likely hold the reason for what scientists call the local hot bubble, LHB, that surrounds the solar system. A recent press release states that the that detectors have located a field of million-degree interstellar plasma that initiates an X-ray glow over the entire sky. NASA astrophysicists found that X-ray background is radiating most strongly in the plane of the Milky Way. According to their theories, it is in that region where X-rays ought to be absorbed. As Massimino Galilei from the University of Miami in Coral Gables, Florida stated, this is a significant discovery, specifically the existence or non-existence of the local bubble affects our understanding of the area of the galaxy close to the sun and can therefore be used as a foundation for future models of the galaxy structure. Electric Universe Theory has already presented information that can partially explain galactic structure and its influence on the solar system. So it doesn't seem really to be anything that they're that concerned about. It seems that it is normal. That's what powers our sun. Well, it's just as I suspected. Mainstream doesn't know what they're dealing with. 
but the electric universe does. It's just the whole point right there in a nutshell. I mean, they walk around in their plutocratic little world, and I don't know. It's like a poem I heard once. It said, silly monkey sits on treetops in the springtime and thinks himself tall. Remember how disgusted you felt when in the closing scene of the film Raiders of the Lost Ark, the Ark of the Covenant, hidden in an anonymous wooden crate, was consigned to a giant warehouse full of similar looking crates? Your reaction was cover up by the government, no doubt. This was fiction. But do such cover-ups exist? One of the most revered historical institutions in the U.S., if not the world, is the Smithsonian Institute, compilers and keepers of American history for as long as anyone can remember. Would they, could they, blatantly ignore the existence of a staggering historical find because it seemed too radical for conventional thinking? People must judge that for themselves. One of the greatest natural wonders of the world cuts deep into the heart of Arizona, the Grand Canyon. Beautiful and breathtaking, this vast cliff in the earth holds many secrets, perhaps none more mysterious than the one reported in the Phoenix Gazette on April, 9, uh, April 5, 1909. An explorer, Juan G. E. Kincaid, who had served at the Smithsonian for over 30 years, was reporting a startling archaeological discovery. Kincaid's boss, Professor S. A. Jordan of the Smithsonian, who were financing the expedition, was said to be enthusiastic about the find, to be further investigated, as it was of major significance. Kincaid had found, which happens to be the same name as the California fire right now, about 2,000 feet up the canyon wall, above the Colorado River, some 42 miles upstream from the El Tovar Crystal Canyon, a cave entrance to a vast underground city chiseled from the solid rock. There were steps up to the cave, suggesting that the river level had been that high when the inhabitants had lived there. This would mean at least 3,000 years had passed since then. How they know how fast the river recedes, I do not know. This would mean this citadel was almost a mile underground and was very precisely carved in geometric patterns over an enormous area. Kincaid reported that several hundred rooms had been discovered but that the full extent of the city was still impossible to estimate. Perhaps the most startling find was the Great Hall, about 100 feet in from the cave entrance. This contained a carved idol, presumably of the god these people worshipped, which he described thus. The idol sits cross-legged with a lotus flower or a lily in each hand. The cast of the face is oriental, and the carving shows a skillful hand being remarkably well preserved. It resembles Buddha, and though scientists are unsure of its religious import, it reminds them strongly of the ancient people of Tibet. Many smaller, beautifully carved images were reported, as was the finding of all kinds of copper tools, preserved by some hardening method which modern-day scientists have failed to emulate. Artistic vases and urns of copper and gold, as well as enameled ware, and glazed vessels were found. Granaries, like those found in Oriental temples, still holding seeds, were also discovered. There was a gray metal found, resembling platinum, which scientists could not identify, and yellow stones known as cat's eyes were everywhere. Each one engraved with a melee type head even more significant was the finding of hieroglyphics, amazingly similar to those found in Egypt. 
Engraved on urns, on tablets, and around doorways, deciphering these would be a major step towards solving the mystery. But did it ever happen? A large crypt was found, with many mummies in it, reportedly well preserved. They were all male, entombed with weapons, suggesting that this was a burial site for soldiers. Though varying degrees of development in the ceramics found with them hint that this was a civilization that was constantly refining itself, it was thought that up to 50,000 people could have lived in this city. They would have been quite safe. Strangely enough, the tradition among the Hopi Indians tells of an ancestry that harks back to their people having once lived in an underworld in the Grand Canyon. Until rivalry broke out between two factions. The good faction, the people of one heart, were led to the outside world by Chief Machetto, while the people of two hearts remained behind. Picture of the Isis Temple in the Grand Canyon. Today, visitors looking from the south rim of the canyon can see the structure called the Isis Temple, a pyramid hewn from the solid rock of the cliff top, and obviously man-made. Page 302 in the book Ancient Secrets of the Flower of Life, Volume 2, holds an account by two backpackers of an exploration of this edifice. They tell of finding cave entrances that had been deliberately sealed, though they did seem man-made, one having a clear six-foot circular pattern carved into the roof. This site is over 40 miles from the one reported in the newspaper article. Yet, why would caves that are almost inaccessible need to be sealed up, and was the originally stated location simply a mistake? G.E. Kincaid was a respected man, the first and an explorer for all his life. His words about the entrance to the citadel are prophetic. First, I would impress that the cavern is nearly inaccessible, he said. The entrance is 1,486 feet down the sheer face of the canyon wall. It is on government land, of course, and no visitor will be allowed under penalty of trespass. A trip there would be fruitless, and the visitor sent on his way. I sent a number of relics to Washington, after which the exploration was undertaken. In the latter part of the 20th century, detailed research by one Carl Monk uncovered a mathematical system employed by the ancients for the exact placement of the Egyptian pyramids, in alignment with certain star systems. The same code can be applied to other such structures, wherever they are found. His findings revealed that the Isis Temple must be a major archaeological site, lined up as precisely as it is with the Great Pyramid of Giza. In 1909, the Grand Canyon Citadel was regarded as not only the oldest archaeological discovery in the United States, but also as one of paramount importance to the world. Yet today, nothing more is known to the public than has already been said. The Grand Canyon is festooned with places that bear ancient Egyptian names, yet no one in authority can tell you why. Interest in the area is highly discouraged by officialdom, and the Smithsonian Institute claimed to have no record of Kincaid, Professor Johnson, or a lost Egyptian civilization in Arizona. The Phoenix Gazette story must have been a hoax. Or could it be that something was discovered back then of such monumental import that it needed to be hushed up forevermore? Did G.E. Kincaid actually exist? With no records of his work or any proof from the Smithsonian that he worked for them, many think the newspaper article was an April Fool's Day joke on the 5th. However, the above copy of an earlier newspaper piece from 1909, published a whole month before the Phoenix Gazette piece appeared, shows that G.C. Kincaid's expedition did indeed happen as reported. What is more, a translated ancient manuscript recently located describes a voyage made thousands of years ago by a group from Asia traveling to a city built within what they called the Canyon of Light intended to visit a holy man, 
or shrine. The descriptions given seem to indicate that this city was to be found in the Grand Canyon. There is also said to be a couple of statues there that have been worn out by the ravages of time. The princess, which could be a coincidence, but on the other side lies a prince. Are these just a coincidence or a pareidolia? A true sophisticated man cave. No one is prepared to answer the question all these things pose. And even though the research done within the Citadel might be proved, beyond doubt, that the race which built it were of Oriental origin. I think, I think it's Asian origin now. This might be old. Possibly Egyptian travelers from the time of Ramses. Hieroglyphs found in Australia point unequivocally to Egyptians having been there at some time. So why not the Americas as well? Remember the cocaine mummies? If they made it to Peru, they could make it to Arizona. Perhaps the Nile, the Colorado, and the Grand Canyon are inextricably linked through a span of time that defies the imagination. But if so, someone has decided that we should never know how strong those links are. The Citadel may officially be no more than an elaborate myth, but the evidence for their contrary view is quite compelling. It would perhaps be unfair to put the lost underground city into the same category as Area 51, but the secrecy surrounding it over 90 years can't help but make you wonder just what was actually discovered. Unfortunately for the inquiring minds amongst us, we may never know. Now they have a 24 hour a day, seven day a week guard, armed guard with an M16 on the site at all times. If there was nothing there, why the guard? To keep people from killing themselves, maybe? I don't know. There's a lot that just don't add up about it. Both ways. It's very interesting, though. Did the ancient Egyptians inhabit the Grand Canyon? The Hopi and the Red and Blue Kachina by Tess Clark. The Hopi of Northeast Arizona descended from the Anasazi peoples, which creates a direct relation to the ancient Aztec culture. They were most likely a group of peoples that migrated north from Teotihuacan, Mexico, throughout North America, becoming also known as the red-headed, elongated skull giants who were also mound builders. Even though it was not the first time the American continent was occupied by a high civilization, these people were the survivors of the wars described in the Mahabharata epic. We left on ships and landed first in the American continent, then spread from the Valley of Mexico northwards and southwards towards Peru and Bolivia, then departed and continued their voyage towards the Polynesian islands, including Easter Island, New Zealand, Hawaii. This timeline matches with the Venus events of 3,600 years ago, or 1450 and 1500 BC, and the arrival of the lord and ruler Quetzalcoatl, Kukulkan, who probably came from Egypt, and was probably the Egyptian ruler known as Thoth, Ningisida, who similarly to Osiris, traveled the world with an army, conquering and civilizing mankind. According to ancient historian Diodorus Siculus, in his Library of History, Book 1, 
which contains the accounts given by the Egyptians of the genesis of the world and their gods. In 1972, a group of hikers exploring a system of hidden caves in Chaco Canyon, Arizona, discovered a group of pictographs and cuneiform writing similar to Sumerian writings with the asterisk symbol of the star of Anu, used when writing clay tablets. And the Nanga Sohu Kashina, or Kachina symbol, is represented as a four-pointed star, similar to the four-pointed star with waves of Sumerian god Anu. Other pictographs found in the Grand Canyon, as discussed by David Childress, resemble Egyptian hieroglyphs. David also presents the legend of the human windmakers that inhabited Chaco Canyon, who brought civilization to them. From History Channel's Ancient Aliens, Series 4, Episode 9, The Time Travelers. According to the Maya, the ruler Quetzalcoatl represented the winged serpent, was a human ruler whose heart transformed into the planet Venus when he left the land and promised to return to restart civilization, peace and order after the next catastrophe. He arrived in Mexico with a group of African-looking people known as the Olmec, possibly from Egypt or Mesopotamia. He created and gave the Maya priesthood all their advanced astronomical knowledge they possessed including the length of the great year, also known by Plato, which is the time the sun orbits Alcyon of the Pleiades, and is what causes the precession of the equinoxes, and lasts between 24 to 26,000 years. And other information still known by the Maya, such as that all energy in the universe spins, the existence of ether, and that the galactic center known as Hunapku produces cyclical pulses of energy that creates and reshapes the galaxies. Approximately in the year 1500 BC, after the catastrophes of the Venus events that sunk or destroyed the remaining of the Atlantean civilization that began approximately 8,000 years ago, forced the survivors to relocate to less affected areas around the world, appeared the cultures of the Kemanawak. See my book World Civilization and the Kemanawak. They are known as Olmecs, or those who measure the movement. Astronomers trained by Quetzalcoatl to track Earth and Venus orbits and create new calendars, as the planets were interacting electrically with each other, at least two times in intervals of 50 and 52 years. Back then, this influence was generalized among cultures. There is DNA evidence that some Polynesian people descend from a race of dolichocephalic or elongated skulls with red, auburn or blonde hair, blue and green eyes with Rh negative blood type, found in the Black Sea, Egypt and Persia. Oral transmission of information passed down from generation to generation to existing families in New Zealand mixed with the Maori native population say that their ancestors about 129 generations, which is about 3,500 years ago, originated from Egypt, Persia, and India. This was one of the waves of migration from the Middle East shortly after the catastrophes and flood that sunk Atlantis, circa 1500 BC. For more information, see Gabby Plum documentaries on the subject. She can be found on YouTube. One of the many Hopi legends specifically references ant people who inhabit the heart of the earth. The word ant in Hopi is Anu, exactly the same word as the Sumerian Akkadian chief god Anu. Similarly to Quetzalcoatl of the Maya, the Anu Sinom taught astronomy, agriculture, and mathematics to the Ana Sasi. Notice the word Ana Sasi starts with An. The Hopi word Sohu meaning star and the Egyptian word Sahu means star of Orion. Hopi prophecies. The Hopi believe that the star people and star knowledge will return at the end of the current cycle of time as they have done in past cycles. Similarly to the fifth sun ages of the Aztecs. And Maya, 
believe that our current sun is not the same as the previous sun or stars, earth or be dead or was under the influence. Could the previous suns have been Uranus, Neptune, Saturn and Jupiter? At the time of the blue Cochina, the Cochina refers to approaching of planets or comets. The star people of the Anusinum moved to underground cities to be protected during the world's destruction. The Hopi Kivas, which are subterranean communal chambers and mounds, would also function as bunkers, protecting to a certain degree against the falling debris, meteor showers, fires, tempests, radiation brought on by the comet. Coincidentally, the Sanskrit word ki means ant hill, and va means dwelling. And ki is Sumerian for earth. Looks like the caves and underground cities of the Chaco Canyon would have been part of the underground cities built by the Anusinum. Comets have long been known as omens of the end times. The Hopi Indians of Arizona have a legend of the Blue Kachina called Sakwa Sohu. Frank Waters and Hopi informant Oswald White Bear Fredericks in the popular book of the Hopi proclaim, quote, The end of all Hopi ceremonialism will come when a Kachina removes his mask during a dance in the plaza before the uninitiated, end quote. This is rumored to have recently happened on the Hopi reservation. From Gary A. Davies' article, Kachinam are not gods per se, but spirits that act as mediators between gods and humans. They may take the form of an any animal, plant, celestial body, or otherworldly creature. During the spring and early summer, the Hopis perform a ceremonial cycle of mass kachina dances as a plea for rain and the general well-being and protection of the tribe. The Hopi elder White Feather of the spiritually important Bear Clan describes nine different signs signaling the end of the fourth world, our current era. The final warning is as follows. Quote, and this is the ninth of the last signs. You will hear of a dwelling place in the heavens, above the earth, that shall fall with a great crash. It will appear as a blue star. Very soon after this, the ceremonies of my people will cease. End quote. The late Robert Ghost Wolf of mixed Hopi, Iroquois, and Lakota descent speaks about star prophecy in relation to the conclusion of Gaia's current cycle. Quote, the story of the Blue Kachina is an old story, very old. I have been aware of the story of the Blue Kachina since I was very young. I was told this story by grandfathers, who are now between 80 and 108 years of age. It was told to me that the first blue kachina would be seen at the dances and would make its appearance known to the children in the plaza during the night dance. The event would tell us that at the end times are very near. The blue star kachina would physically appear in our heavens which would mean that we are in the end times." End quote. According to Dr. Ghost Wolf, this kachina is also known as Nanga Sohu or chasing star kachina. The Hopi word nanga means to pursue, and sohu means star. Sometimes this kachina refers to Venus, because its morning and evening appearances seem to chase each other. Or is it because Venus had caused catastrophes in the past, as mentioned above? The Hopi Indians say the blue star is about to appear again, and soon after the arrival of the blue star Kachina, the red star Kachina, Paha Sohu, would come and act as a purifier. The hope is called the Pleiadian, the Chu Hu Kon, meaning those who cling together. They consider themselves direct descendants of the Pleiadians. The Navajos 
Name the Pleiadians, the Sparkling Sons, or the Deliyahe, the home of the Black God. The Iroquois prayed to them for happiness. The Cree believed to have come to Earth from the stars in spirit form first and then became flesh and blood. The Mayan also believed that their ancestors come from the Pleiades. Early Dakota stories speak of the Tiyami home of the ancestors as being the Pleiades. The Anasazi left innumerable images painted or etched upon canyon walls. Many of these pictographs represent plasma formations seen in the skies, such as the Squatterman, and the plasma formations of comet tails, as well as animals that they obviously saw, including animals that were no longer seen today, such as dinosaurs. The Hopi believe time to be cyclical and made up of a number of worlds. When a world begins, it is innocent and pure. But as time goes by, the world and its people become corrupted. At the height of decay, the world ends, its people are purified, and everything starts over from the beginning. According to the Hopi lore, we are currently living in the fourth world, and the fifth soon to come. This is very similar to the morals since Sumerian times about why the world ends, or even the Christian beliefs. During global cataclysms, when the first world or world age was destroyed by fire and the second world was destroyed by ice, either extreme cooling or new ice sheets and glaciers forming due to a physical pole shift or axis tilt of several degrees. The virtuous or high priest and ruling members of the Hopi tribe were guided during the day by an odd-shaped cloud, similarly to the pillar of fire that guided the Israelites during the Exodus, and at night they were guided by a comet or moving star that led them to the sky god named Sotuknag, who finally took them to the Anusinom. The ant people then escorted the Hopi into subterranean caves where they found refuge and sustenance. People returned to the surface to live as ants for the duration of the second world. The third world describes an advanced civilization with flying shields, comets, meteors, and plasma formations seen in the skies similar to the Hindu Vimanas, and wars between distant cities eventually destroyed by great floods. Sounds like Mahabharata. The Hopi believe that they are now the caretakers of the fourth world in exchange for the privilege of surviving the cataclysms. They believe the coming of the fifth world is near and will commence when members of the fire clan return. Are they referring to comets? Legend of the Blue Kachina also coincides with Mayan prophecy, suggesting an interconnection between Hopi beliefs and those of the ancient Mayans. Furthermore, the legend of Pahana seems to be in direct relation to the story of Quetzalcoatl, connecting the Hopi to several North American and South American Indian cultures, who recognize the horned serpent. Additional creation stories and religious beliefs systems resemble other ancient civilizations in both North and South America and other places in the world. According to the Hopi, five stone tablets of creation exists. One was kept by the Creator, two given to the Hopi themselves, and the remaining two given to the brothers in history to be brought back together when the world reunites in peace, holding true in the Hopi way. Many Hopi prophecies are not original to the Hopi people, who seldom share their knowledge with the outside world. Through one solar cycle, the sun virtually blinks out. Additionally, you have in x-rays this equally profound regional variation. And we have to reflect on how could it happen in a, that a thermonuclear core would produce, by heat transferred outward, a uniquely stable 
photosphere. And then as you rise into higher elevations, you get profound variability of emissions. What is causing that variability? Well, here's something that bears directly on that kind of question. And the, the line you see there is a voltage curve that was initially produced by Ralph Jurgens, a brilliant engineer who is, you might say, the father of the electric sun hypothesis. This the standard solar model, this is the culprit. Arthur Eddington deduced the nuclear energy concept of stars. He based it on a number of premises, all of which were false, and yet he had the temerity to say it should not be too difficult to understand such a simple thing as a star. He used gravity and simple gas laws applicable on Earth but not in the solar plasma, which resulted in a simplistic model that took no account of the observed complexities of the sun. It is an impossible solar model because the coronal temperature is in the millions of degrees, the chromosphere is 10,000, photosphere 5,700, and the core requires a temperature of the order of 15 million degrees and an unreal density for hypothetical nuclear fusion. Even the nuclear fusion reactions cannot be tested. And in order to make it work, it involved quantum tunneling and all sorts of uh, magical tricks to try and get a theory which would work. It was very clever, but is it real? It also needs a radiative zone unknown in, inside any other hot body. That had to be put in, of course, because you've got intense X-rays coming from a 15 million degree core, and somehow that had to be converted into just heat and light at the surface. Now here's Ralph Jurgens. you've seen him before, some of you. He presented in the 70s, 1972, a gas discharge model of the sun. He wrote, the modern astrophysical concept that ascribes the sun's energy to thermonuclear reactions deep in the solar interior is contradicted by nearly every observable aspect of the sun. I was inspired when I read his article. He provided a detailed gas discharge model applicable to all stars, a single model for all stars. This is uh, quite distinct from uh, modern cosmology, which has a separate theory for every star. So electric stars, like the lights of a great city at night, stars are lit at great distances from where their power is being generated. Each star forms the focus of a Z-pinch in the current stream. An electric star, for stars like the sun, the current flows in dark mode, so we don't see the spectacular glow mode bipolar wiring harnesses of supernovae and planetary nebulae. But every star has this form in its current feed system. Then how do we look at the sun within the heliosphere? Because these plasma sheaths, or the heliosphere, protects what's inside from the electrical environment outside. Most of the voltage that drives the sun occurs out at that distant boundary. This is why the spacecraft that are traversing that region at present are suffering so many surprises because nothing's behaving the way they expected. They thought it was just a collisional boundary. It's not. Most of the voltage that drives the sun occurs across that thin boundary, and the result is, as Ralph Jurgen suggested, it's the origin of most of the cosmic rays in our galaxy. Every star has this cosmic ray accelerator at the boundary of its heli heliosphere. <coughs> it's called the virtual cathode, because if the sun forms the anode here, and it's just a coronal discharge into thin air, thin vacuum. There is a virtual cathode set up by the plasma. It's the boundary of the sun's electrical influence. It is the virtual cathode in the stellar corona discharge. And most of the sun's driving voltage appears across the plasma sheath. A very important point, because uh, all of those who, um, the pseudo-skeptics I call them, who attack this model, so where are all the relativistic electrons streaming past the Earth? You know, we should see them. The point is, if you'll notice, that this here is the voltage gradient through most of the heliosphere. The only place where you'll see swift changes in that uh, voltage gradient is at the virtual cathode. You'll notice the size of it here, and this little blip when you get into the corona. That's the thing that accelerates the uh, particles in the corona and heats them to 20 million degrees.
Electric Universe, or Thunderbolts, has this to say about the new solar cycle is off to a slow start. November 7, 2019. Sunspots are not well understood by the mainstream, nor the Electric Universe advocates. However, it is known that magnetism is involved with sunspot activity. Because gigantic loops and whorls of plasma can often be seen connecting two or more of them, why or how magnetism is at work on the sun remains unclear. In consensus, opinions, filaments and fibrils can be detected with high-resolution photographic equipment in the penumbra or darkened cores of sunspots. Sunspot penumbra are another mystery to the mainstream. The standard solar model does not predict such structures. The electric model does predict them, and they correspond to an electrical description. Electric discharges often appear as long, twisted filaments, or funnels of glowing plasma, whose centers are darker convection cells would have darker edges. This is one example where understanding the difference between hot gas, which does not contain charged particles, and plasma, which, which does contain charged particles, and can be electrically active, could provide some illumination. Sunspots are not the result of gas convection modified by magnetism. Sunspots are electrical structures. In the electrical model, the sunspot cycle is most likely a result of fluctuations in the electrical power supply from the local arm of the Milky Way galaxy. As the varying current density in magnetic fields of huge Birkeland current filaments slowly rotate past our solar system, they apply more or less power to the electrical circuit that lights up our daytime sky. Rather than a weak sun, the lack of sunspots here at the beginning of solar cycle 25 is most likely due to a weaker current flow through the galaxy. That's a little scary. Recent picture of the day articles address the issues that make understanding the sun exceptionally difficult. There are serious dichotomies between the consensus viewpoint and the solar activity and the electric universe viewpoint. In particular, the hypothesis popularized in Professor Don Scott's book, The Electric Sky, is diametrically opposed to the thermonuclear hypothesis first described by Sir Arthur Eddington in 1926. The sun's 11-year cycle of increased and decreased output is linked to the severity of weather events, such as hurricanes or droughts on Earth. Although solar energy varies over the course of a sunspot cycle, the variance amounts to less than one-tenth of one percent, far too little to account for the intensity seen in storm systems or the increased regions of drought. Uneven thermal distribution is thought to cause increased atmospheric convection, resulting in greater tropical precipitation combined with convection. The extrasolar energy heats the waters in the Pacific Ocean where, in it is said, more clouds form in an area where they are normally absent. The clouds then flow west along the more powerful convection currents, trade winds, where they increase the effects of stratospheric heating. The climate model suggested by consensus investigators is based on kinetic energy, heat, and the movement of the atmosphere. Nowhere in the, in the scientific press is it reported that the electric currents and strength of the ion flux from the sun are the primary drivers of climate of climate fluctuations stephen smith nuclear fantasies neutron stars cannot exist the sky was clear remarkably clear and the twinkling of all the stars seemed to be the throbs of one body timed by a common Pulse, Thomas Hardy. On June 13, 2012, NASA launched the Nuclear Spectroscopic Telescope Array, NUSTAR, on a mission to study X-rays and what are thought to be remnants of supernova explosions called pulsars. 
Newstar joins other X-ray space telescopes like Chandra and XMM Newton, except that it is capable of focusing X-rays to a sharp point, enabling it to see energies up to 79,000 electron volts. That capacity makes it more than 100 times more powerful than the other observatories. Pulsars are often reported to be lighthouses in space, with rotating beams concentrated at specific points on their surfaces. Gravitational theory relies on rotational mechanism in their pulsations. So when a spin of a pulsar brings its beam in line with telescopes on Earth, a flash of light is visible. Pulsars are said to be neutron stars with magnetic fields measuring over 10 to the 15 Gauss. For comparison, Earth's magnetic field is about one half Gauss. It must be stressed, though, that no neutron star has ever been observed. Since the magnetic fields pulse in fractions of a second, and it is well established that magnetic fields are induced by electric currents, there must be electricity generating the intense fields in a pulsar. However, as mentioned, the rotation rates of some pulsars are faster than once every second. Nothing can withstand the forces involved with those spin rates. So neutron stars are mathematically created. Only something so dense was thought able to withstand the rotational velocity. For example, the Crab Nebula pulses at 30 times per second. That's moving. Or 30 hertz. That means the star is theoretically rotating 30 times per second. There are pulsars with frequencies as high as 716 hertz as well. In an electric universe, the regular frequency is not mechanically generated. Instead, it is the capacitive, resistive, and inductive electrical environment around a star that generates oscillations. Recently, astrophysics from the University of Cagliari, Italy, used the New Star Telescope to observe IGR J175912342 such a great name, an X-ray source spinning at 527.4 hertz, 1.9 milliseconds. Picture of the day articles address the problem of neutron stars. Considering them to be imaginary objects, gravity-only cosmology makes neutron star theory necessary because gravity has endless powers in the consensus view. However, compacted matter and extreme rotation are not necessary. Electricity traveling through circuits provide a coherent explanation that is consistent with commonly accepted electromagnetic theories, as well as with laboratory experiments. Pulsar oscillations are caused by resonant effects in those electric circuits. A release of stored electrical energy in a double layer is responsible for their energetic outbursts. Pulsars often shine in X-ray and gamma ray light, the outbursts begin with a sudden peak of energy and then gradually decline, like a stroke of lightning. It seems more like that an immense concentration of electricity being focused by some kind of plasma gun effect is driving pulsar behavior. Stephen Smith Saturn has the most moons. How about that? New moons of Saturn. 20 new moons discovered around Saturn. It's just crazy. A team led by Carnegie's Scott Shepard has found 20 new moons orbiting Saturn. This brings the ringed planet's total to 82 moons, surpassing Jupiter, which has 79. So we'll see what how many Jupiter has next week. 
The discovery was announced on October 7th by the International Astronomical Union Minor Planet Center. Each of the newly discovered moons is above 5 kilometers, or 3 miles, in diameter. Small. I wonder, do they grow? Then maybe all moons start out like that. Maybe Earth was a tiny baby once. 17 of them orbit the planet backwards, or in retrograde direction, meaning their movement is opposite of the planet's rotation around its axis. The other three moons orbit in prograde, the same direction as Saturn rotates. Two of the prograde moons are closer to the planet and take about two years to travel once around Saturn. The more distant retrograde moons and one of the prograde moons each take about three years to complete an orbit. If there's not, I don't really think there'll be many colli collisions many collision because they're probably in uh, some kind of a magnetic field and they're going to avoid each other or repel each other. Studying the orbits of these moons can reveal their origins as well as information about the conditions surrounding Saturn at the time of its formation, Shepard said. The outer moons of Saturn appear to be grouped into three different clusters of, in terms of, of the inclinations of the angles at which they are orbiting around the planet. Two of the newly discovered prograde moons fit in a group of outer moons with inclinations of 46 degrees, called the Inuit group, as they are named after Inuit mythology. These moons may have once comprised a larger moon that was broken apart in the distant past. Likewise, the newly announced retrograde moons have similar inclinations to other previously known retrograde Saturnian moons, indicating they are also like fragments from a once larger parent moon that was broken apart. Well, yeah, you never know. Maybe they've been going around it all along, we just haven't had instruments good enough to detect them. I mean, you're almost a mile or two miles across. I don't know if that qualifies for a moon, just like Ju uh, Jupiter's new ones. I wonder what's going on with that. Likewise, the newly announced retrograde moons have similar inclinations to other previously known retrograde Saturnian moons, indicating they are also like fragments from a once larger parent moon. These retrograde moons are in the Norse group. I didn't know there was a Norse group. Okay, names coming from North, Norse mythology. One of the newly discovered retrograde moons is the furthest known moon around Saturn. Well, there you have it. Saturn and Jupiter are dueling for the king of the moons. If a significant amount of gas or dust were present when a larger moon broke apart or created the clusters of smaller moon fragments. Eh, I don't know, I wonder what the electric universe has to say about it. I'll look for something. There would have been strong frictional interactions between the smaller moons and the gas and dust, causing them to spiral into the planet. And the so uh, they're going to talk about the solar system's youth. Oh, they don't know the first thing about it. Last year, Shepard discovered 12 new moons orbiting Jupiter. So he's the same guy that discovered the Jupiter moons. I was so thrilled with the amount of public engagement over the Jupiter moon naming contest that we've decided to do another one and name these newly discovered Saturnian moons. This time the moons must be named after giants from Norse, Gallic, or Inuit mythology. And there you have it as a contest actually. So if you want to name the moons, the contest date is, well, ends December 6th. Right there. And that's it. Maybe Velikovsky wasn't so far off in his assessment that the Sun, Jupiter, and Saturn may be the creators of comets. If one reaches escape velocity, that's what it would become. I am the smartest man alive!
NASA tracks Diablo winds powering massive Kincaid wildfire in California. See the picture there? Poor California has been through so much. Gusting winds in Northern California are helping the spread of the Kincaid wildfire, as shown in a new animation from NASA. Meanwhile, Maxar Technologies captured infrared images. The fire is using its suite of Earth observing satellites. The winds, which are known as Diablo winds, have reached speeds as high as 96 miles an hour, 150 kilometers. This fuels the fires, making it more difficult for firefighters to keep them under control. The fire grew by nearly 48,000 acres, 19,400 hectares, between October 26th and October 28th alone. More than 2,000 people have evacuated from the blaze. I mean, is California going to burn down or what? Which has consumed more than 120 structures. NASA's new animation visualizes data captured between October 20th and October 28th, showing strong gusts in yellow and weak winds in purple. This data comes from the Goddard Earth Observing System Model 5, GOS-5, a weather model that NASA is experimenting with to better understand weather around the world. This model takes the data from 30 sources, such as satellites, ships, aircraft, and buoys. The Diablo winds tend to originate in the Great Basin region of Nevada. A huge fire that's now clocked in at 21,000 acres in Guyersville, California, bloated in size in just a day. The Kincaid fire started the night of October 24th near John Kincaid Road and burned Mountain Road. How appropriate. Just northeast of Geyserville, according to the California governor and in just a little more than a day, the fire has already burned 21,900 acres in size. What started the blaze? Here's what we know so far about what caused the fire. Broken PG&E equipment was found near where the fire started, but the fire's cause is not yet determined. A broken jumper cable was reported at the transmission tower around 9.20 on Wednesday. California fire personnel found the broken jumper on the tower after the fire had started. An equipment failure occurred on a high voltage line near the fire's origins on Wednesday night. This was found in an incident report sent to the California Public Utilities Commission. They also noted PG&E learned of the issue when the line didn't reclose that Wednesday night. The utility said that the transmission level outage on the power line relayed and did not reclose. Uh, um, reclosers will send energy through a line after a fault occurs and restore energy rather than sending a repair crew if the problem is just temporary. However, for severed lines, reclosures can send sparks through down lines. 
NBC noted January 2018 that they left reclosers on before that 2017 in North Bay fires. In May 2019, the utility, utility dive noted that California regulators wanted PG&E to consider disabling reclosers as a mitigation measure to reduce the need for de-energizing lines. This would keep lines from automatically attempting to re-energize after the fault, which could cause the spark for a wildfire. Yes, sometimes those lines, they got those big giant things that disconnect and sometimes them lines just want to keep going. That's when you see those big flows of fire between them. It can be pretty insane. California has suffered its worst drought for six years. It's mentioned that it's finally over now. And this forest fire is like crazy there this year, just burning the state down. And a camera might have captured the moment of fire. Red flag conditions played a role in helping the fire grow as fast as it did. High winds coupled with dry weather helped the fire grow by thousands of acres so fast. And I got a video here. Let's see this uh, showing might show when the fire started. Oh, I see it. Well. The belted Earl has spoken. Ancient Babylonian Omens Verify Date of Massive Solar Storm October 22nd, scientists looking to verify the date of a massive solar storm that lit up the skies and left its signature in the rings and trees over 2,000 years ago are getting help from some unlikely sources. Ancient Babylonian astrologers and prophets of doom. A team of Japanese scientists recently went digging through ancient records of omens written on stone in cuneiform to confirm the date range of this massive solar storm. The scientists say these ancient astrologers and sky watchers dedicated note taking and interpretations could be useful to predict future massive solar storms, the kind that could spell doom. The ancient kingdoms of Babylon and Assyria and Mesopotamia, the cradle of civilization so-called, were home to some of the first professional astronomers. These philosophers and astronomers would watch the skies and record any anomalies they saw on palm-sized stone tablets and astrologers. And I always think, why would you think the planets would have so much influence in your life if there were little dots in the sky? That also indicates they were much closer, but they don't ever talk about that. Along with predictions on whether the weird stuff showing up in the sky was a good or bad omen. These stone tablets would be signed, dated, and then sent to government officials who would use the omens to make decisions. Don't laugh, they did pretty well. After all, it wouldn't be called the cradle of civilization if it ended up completely bungled because of bad astronomy. It says astrology, but of course they're going to blame it on astrology. But they don't really know what they were, what it, what it was about. They refused to learn. Uh, I'm sorry, Your Highness, but it looks like you'll be dead in a week. <laughs> <laughs> A few millennia later, scientists can use these stone tablets to triangulate the approximate date of a supremely massive solar storm. Scientists already had an inkling of when the solar storm took place due to carbon isotopes it left in the trees. Well, that was probably from when Saturn flared. They still think it's the sun. That's okay. Around 7 the 7th century BCE, in a paper published in the journal, that just happens to line up one of Velikovsky's dates. Astrophysical letters, Japanese scientists reveal how the stone tablets of ancient soothsayers helped confirm it. After digging through the records of ancient tablets, the scientists found they found three that looked like what they were after. The three tablets are all from the 7th or 8th century BCE and mention the sky turning red, red clouds, or a red glow. Unfortunately, none of these tablets were dated, but they were all signed by a different 
ancient astronomer Isar Sinumeris, Nuba, Nuba Ahariba, and Zikiru. These three astronomers all reported directly to the kings of Babylon. Social scientist Yez Yazuki Mitsuma. Yazuki Mitsuma says, Although the exact dates of the observations are not known, we were able to narrow the range considerably by knowing when each astrologer was active. It's a pretty picture of the sun there in all its raging glory. The sun could end us any time it wants. The window when all three astronomers, uh, yeah, when all three astronomers were active, is only 29 years from 60, 679 to 655 BC. The research also sets out a new standard for the earliest reliable observations of an aurora by a full 100 years. The researchers say that this is a valuable new method of determining the dates of solar storms and could help predict the next big one. Mitsuma says. These findings allow us to recreate the history of solar activity a century earlier than previously available records. This research can assist in our ability to predict future solar magnetic storms which may damage satellites or other spacecraft. We know that there will very well be a solar storm in our future that completely knocks out the grid and sends us to post-apocalyptic hellscape. Isn't it comforting knowing we're using 2,000-year-old fortune tellers to predict it? Well. We're obsessed with Doomsday. Ever since I can remember, there was always some date that people thought the world was going to end. I am the smartest man alive! And it comes and goes. One day they'll be right, but I think we're pretty safe for a while. Oldest known aurora record dates back to 679 BC. In the Astrophysical Journal Letters, the authors of a new study recently described the ancient Assyrian stone tablets that now hold the oldest known reports of auroras. The cuneiform descriptions of the phenomena date back over 2,500 years ago and predate other known historical references to auroras by about a century. According to a new study, auroras are dazzling light shows that take place when waves of charged particles from the sun collide with the Earth's magnetic field. Earth was likely visited by an immense solar storm around the 7th century BC, and the auroras described in the tablets may have been the result of that powerful solar activity. The study authors wrote on October 7th in the Astrophysical Journal Letters. Ancient sky-gazing accounts, such as the one on these Assyrian tablets, helped the scientists piece together a more complete picture of Earth's cosmic tango with its solar partner. Because telescope observations have been around for a mere 400 years, they provide only a very small snapshot, at best, of how our sun behaves, said a leading study author, Kasazi Hayakawa, an astrophysicist at Osaka University in Japan, and a visiting researcher at the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in the United Kingdom. Earlier this year, another team of researchers found that a massive solar storm about ten times stronger than any in modern history swept over the Earth around 2,600 years ago. And how? Fingerprints of this storm's intense geomagnetic bombardment were left behind as radioactive atoms trapped in Greenland's ice. Authors of the new study wondered if Assyrian astrologists from that period might have recorded anything unusual that could be linked to the solar storm. The researchers investigated 389 reports on the cuneiform tablets in the collection of the British Museum. Most of the reports described planetary and lunar activity, but three records noted phenomena that were likely candidates for auroras, red glow, red cloud, and red sky. Hmm. According to the study, these descriptions themselves are quite consistent with the early modern descriptions of the auroral display. Hayakawa told, what a name, Hayakawa, 
It's all live science in an email indeed. Red is the color typically found in low altitude auroras and red dwarf stars. Oh, I'm sorry, no, that wasn't in there. And the auroras produced by low energy electrons in the researchers reported. Today, auroras in the northern hemisphere are usually associated with regions close to the North Pole. But Earth's magnetic field is dynamic and changing. And thousands of years ago, magnetic north was about 10 degrees closer to the Middle East than it is today, increasing the likelihood of spectacular aurora displays in that part of the world, the study authors reported. And even during the late 19th century, auroras were still glimpsed in Cairo, Baghdad, and Alexandria, Egypt, Hayakawa added. When you have significant magnetic storms, it is not something extremely surprising to see aurorae in the Middle East, even in the early modern period, Hayakawa said. The infrequency of those descriptions in the Assyrian records suggested that the writers had witnessed was something out of the ordinary and not, for example, a reddened sky that might accompany a vivid sunset or a red dwarf star. Prior to this discovery, he didn't say it, prior to this discovery, the earliest known reference to an aurora was in a Babylonian tablet known as the Astronomical Diaries dating to 567 BC. The Assyrian records allow us to trace the history of solar activity back a century, earlier than the earliest existing datable aurora reports, according to the study. Photos, uh, ancient inscriptions tell of Assyrian King Ashanazerpal II. Red Phoenix, Starburst Galaxy, Light Up Skies. Okay, let's check this out here. A number of artifacts with inscriptions have survived the destructions of the ancient Assyrian city of Nimrud. Live science showed photographs of some of the inscriptions to scholars who were able to identify what they say. In this high-res image, a statue with carved remains of legs can be seen sticking out of a pile of destroyed artifacts. The inscription Beside the legs tells the story of how the Assyrian king Shirnazerpal II, reign 883 to 859 BC, founded a monkey colony at Nimrud. The king received female monkeys as tribute from lands near the Mediterranean coast and bred them with male monkeys. He also obtained, or already had, to found the colony. The inscription says herds of them in great numbers lived in Nimru. Okay. The inscription describes who Anzurazerpal II was and who his father and grandfather were. It also describes the lands he conquered and the palace he built at Nimru. The text on this inscription, one of at least eight known examples of this inscription, from the ancient world. A translation was published in 1991 by Albert Kirk Grayson. I built this palace for the eternal admiration of rulers and princes and decorated it in a splendid fashion. Part of the inscription says, translated by Grayson, sadly most of the palace was destroyed by ISIL. Okay, and there's a uh, surviving modern war. This work of art was actually restored sometimes before the war and somehow survived the destruction of Nimrud by ISIL. Is that them kooks that were destroying all the ancient works? Crazy. It shows a winged genie, a common motif in ancient Assyrian art. The inscription on the work of art records that it is the property of Assyrian Azurpal the second. Another surviving work of art, albeit badly damaged, Iraq archaeologists have arrived on site and hope to clean and put back together the surviving art. In ancient times, this inscription was also copied multiple times. It says that the artwork is the property of the palace of Assyrian Azurpal, vice regent of Assur, chosen of the gods, Enlil and Ninurta, beloved of the gods Anu and Dagon, destructive weapon of the great gods, strong king, king of the universe, king of Assyria, old and beautiful. 
His tablet also survived the destruction of Nimrud, the great frame, a professor of Near Eastern languages and civilizations at the University of Pennsylvania notes that in ancient times it was also copied down multiple times after the name and titles of the king. It summarizes his conquests and then records the building and decoration of the palace at Nimrud frame and that survived the onslaught. As archaeologists conserve, record, and photograph the surviving artifacts, more information on what survived will become available. So those crackpots really did destroy some ancient works, huh? Shame on them. And last but not least, the ancient Egyptians' weighing of the heart and admonitions of Mott. Concepts of living in balance. I guess when they die, they're supposed to be able to say this. And they get weighed, you know, with the feather. And uh, if they're lying, they get eaten up by a creature. But um, I just wanted to read them and see how... Uh, there's quite a few of them, so let's read them. I have not committed sin. I have not committed robbery with violence. I have not stolen. I have not slain men and women. I have not stolen food. I have not swindled offerings. I have not stolen from God. I have not told lies. I have not carried away food. I have not cursed. I have not closed my ears to truth. Interesting. I have not committed adultery. I have not made anyone cry. I have not felt sorrow without reason. I guess that's uh, not a good thing. It's kind of a sin to be sad without a reason. I would think that would be like someone who's depressed. That's interesting. Uh, I remember hearing something too, a Saturn punishes the melancholy. Yeah, it's, I guess it wouldn't be a good thing, would it? I don't remember ever being sad without cause. I, I have not assaulted anyone. I am not deceitful. I have not stolen anyone's land. I have not been an eavesdropper. I have not falsely accused anyone. I have not been angry without reason. I have not seduced anyone's wife. I have not polluted myself. Interesting. I have not terrorized anyone. I have not disobeyed the law. I have not been excessively angry. I have not cursed God. I have not behaved with violence. I have not caused disruption of peace. I have not acted hastily or without thought. I have not overstepped my boundaries of concern. Hmm. I have not exaggerated my words when speaking. I have not worked evil. I have not used evil thoughts, words, or deeds. I have not polluted the water. I have not spoken angrily or arrogantly. I have not cursed anyone in thought, word, or deed. I have not placed myself on a pedestal. I have not stolen that which belongs to God. I have not stolen from or disrespected the deceased. I have not taken food from a child. I have not acted with insolence. I have not destroyed property belonging to God. 42. Hmm. Yeah, that's pretty good. I like that. <laughs> the virtues of Ma. Yeah, we already read that, but I'll read it again. Control of thoughts, control of actions, devotion to purpose. Have a faith in the ability of your teacher to teach you the truth. Have faith in yourself to... To assimilate the truth, have faith in themselves to wield truth, be free from resentment under the experience of persecution, be free from resentment under the experience of wrong, cultivate the ability to distinguish between right and wrong, and cultivate the ability to distinguish between real and unreal. Truth is like lightning, its errand is done before you hear the thunder. Gerald Massey, Principles of Ma, there they are. Right. 
Those are all pretty good virtues there, and I think it pretty much covered the gamut. In other words, you have to live a stellar life. That's mighty clean living. Hard to believe people like that took slaves. But kingdoms change, just like governments and everything else. Things always seem to go from the best to the worst. The Jeb Pillar has always intrigued me. What do you think? What does it look like to you? I would like to thank special guest Tess Clark for doing a wonderful piece on the Hopi Indians and the Red and Blue Kachina. If you'd like to do a guest spot, let me know. I'll sign you up. Dear Shadow, doing a story. Did you ever say to yourself, I can do that? Well, now's the time to find out. And even if you're a seasoned pro, that's no problem. I'd like you to think about joining my Patreon or PayPal core. You get bonus audios. The library is growing. I like to add to it at least three times a week, sometimes more. Depends on how busy I am with the videos. And I'd like to take this time to wish each and every one of you a happy Thanksgiving, if and we don't talk by then. And uh, I guess that'll do it. Thanks for coming. Take care. And I'll see you on down the road. Watch your top now. Well, the belted earl has spoken. Many like to say that uh, Hubble's find discovery of the redshift is one of the greatest discoveries in the history of astronomy. I would probably not agree with that. I think it's probably one of the major hamstrings of modern astronomy because the plot was wrong. Halt and Art proved with empirical evidence that the redshift is non-cosmological. It has to do with age. As these quasars age, they probably most likely turn into Magellanic clouds and then go into galaxies. As a matter of fact, I believe I read it on Wikipedia, the large Magellanic cloud is starting to form arms for a spiral galaxy. Light they, they can detect. So the Milky Way is probably its parent. If you could figure out how old the Magellanic clouds are, that would date back to the last time the Milky Way was active enough to birth a quasar faint arm so they don't even know about the classification on that yet so there's no doubt that Halton Arp nailed this and I think he should have the greatest discovery in the history of astronomy and that's what we're all trying to do those of us that know the truth and have the clarity to see it and do not accept the way that he was treated are behind him 100% it's important that you see this information